الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين. And so our conversation today is one related to much of what you had brought up about, you know, how have we been doing as a Muslim community for this period of time? And what I thought might be useful is actually to go um, stepwise over the last, you know, six years or so, I think is what I'm going to walk us through, particularly since um, today, mashallah, this is uh, co-hosted by, um, uh, you know, or hosted by CARE and all the great work that CARE has been doing, kind of really working on helping Muslims in the U.S. and in Western spheres to really, um, you know, do but do better. It's really part of our wellness as we think about how we as a Muslim community are coping with everything that's been happening. So allow me, inshallah, to walk us through a little bit of, um, you know, short-term history lane, but then eventually towards the end of the talk, I'm going to go really into history of our, our history as Muslims and mental health, inshallah. So with that, I'm going to share with you the first resource, which is the lab. My lab at Stanford University is called the Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab. And so much of the work that happens in this lab is directly, uh, so much of what I'm going to present today is really directly derived from the work that happens in the lab. It's a very bustling lab with a lot of uh, wonderful researchers and interns and junior, um, you know, clinicians and junior researchers who are kind of working on becoming, inshallah, experts in the field of mental health. I'm very excited that there are many more Muslims entering into this field and working on on it um, in a way that just wasn't the case a decade ago, certainly not two decades ago. And, um, you know, even myself, I have to say, and I know many people, and this was touched on in the introduction today, there is still a good bit of stigma around mental health. But I'm hoping today's conversation, not just in how we're doing as Muslims and our mental health, but also as we talk about our history and our heritage related to mental health, I really hope a lot of this, a lot of that stigma will start to just crumble. Because I believe that as we start to know and understand more about our own heritage about this field as Muslims, more and more of that goes away. And so let me first walk you through 2017. Let's start there. These images are ones that I'm sure you're well aware of and everyone has seen. Some of these pictures, especially some of the ones on the bottom, are directly from um, actually our here in San Francisco, <laughs> Bay Area where I'm located, and uh, the airport, you know, when the travel ban was announced, which of course all of us refer to as the Muslim ban. And so, you know, 2017 and the mark of the last administration really kind of marked a very explicit Islamophobic um, atmosphere. And that carried with it quite a bit of angst, particularly from members of the Muslim community that were affected by the ban directly, and all the others who really felt like, will we be next? Or what's to come? Is there a Muslim registry, as was being called for at the time? And so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's very painful to even walk down that memory lane, but it's very important to name and to really say that that was, you know, that, and, and in many ways, this pain has not fully resolved. So we add, right? We're kind of going year by year and kind of adding different um, uh, key mark, key, you know, landmark, if you will, incidents that have happened and really contributed to how we are doing today. Now, many of you, I hope, know who this person is, mashallah, <laughs> one of our shiros, of course, in the Muslim community, um, Ibtihaj Muhammad, mashallah. And in, you know, the previous Olympics, uh, you know, is, of course, a medalist for the U.S., the first uh, hijabi representing the United States and came home with a medal, alhamdulillah. And, um, of course, here she's holding up her uh, Barbie doll that's made in her image, um, by Mattel some years ago. And this, the date doesn't say here, but it's actually 2018. It's the following year. I put this picture here as we reflect on the year 2018 and how, you know, it's in the, we're still in the midst of this angst, you know, in the Muslim community. And, there, and there's so much, um, you know, really demonizing Muslim communities. And here comes a very special moment for us to celebrate right? And we're very proud of this moment. And for any girl who grew up in the U.S. Um, or really honestly in the, in the world, Mattel has, of course, a global reach and who played with dolls, particularly Barbie dolls. This, you know, this was a win. This was something that was very exciting. This was something of seeing, wow, you know, a Barbie doll with a hijab on, not just an ordinary doll, but somebody who's a real shiro in so many different ways. Um, and it was, it was a really neat celebration. Well, the day I saw this picture, um, I was scrolling through and kind of saw this picture and went, whoa, this is so cool. And my daughter, who at the time, 
of the story is about 10 and she kind of peers over my shoulder and she says, what is it, mom? What is it? What is it? You know? And so I kind of, you know, turn my screen and show her very excitedly show her dad like this is really cool and um and she's like wow is that real you know as i'm sure many of us have had similar reactions when we saw this uh news announcement and i tell her yes alhamdulillah this is this is real let me tell you about this and later in time mashallah she had actually the opportunity to meet sister dad in person but as I was scrolling, and this is why the picture, this is why the, the story is relevant, as I was scrolling to see the comments of people as they're commenting on this, right? And Muslims and people who are not Muslim are both writing, and there's much praise and much excitement. But then there's also this, and mind you, my daughter is still, you know, peering over my shoulder. And this is what shows up next in the images. To the point that I literally like gasped, right? And kind of like pushed the, you know, the screen away from my daughter. And she's like, what is it? What is it? And I remember at that very moment, needing to take a moment and really think about, you know, on your feet as a parent, do you bust a child's innocence right then and there and tell them that this is how many <laughs> around us think about a hijabi Muslim woman? you know, a visible Muslim woman. This is the image that conjures up in so many minds. This And the comment under this particular picture that was posted was, well, if Mattel is going to make hijab-wearing woman, this is how the next one should be made. Because this is how Muslim women really are. And, you know, I couldn't even think about how we were just celebrating a success and almost immediately it was kind of like a whack-a-mole, like boom, you know, kind of like over your head of there goes the celebration, right? But nevertheless, of course, it's very much still a celebration. But in that moment, trying to make a decision, split second decision, what do I say to my kid? Do I just sort of say nothing, nothing, don't worry about it? Or do I actually sit her down and say, this is the reality of what so many women who are visible as Muslims, who are often, as you know, the brunt of all Islamophobic attacks, the majority happen with visible Muslim women, um, followed, of course, by other uh, Muslims who are visible in our identity. Um, or do I just allow her to go about her, you know, innocence for a little bit longer, right? And these are the decisions that many of us have to make on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of like leading up, I'm kind of leading up, of course, on a story of how the mental health of so many of Muslims in our communities have been facing. Let's go on to 2019. And... The issues are not getting any better. In fact, in many ways, they're getting worse. And I put here a couple of um, publications from the lab um, in which I wrote about, and I'm going to give a trigger warning here because I'm going to bring up the topic of suicide. And um, it's actually going to come up uh, more, actually, in a couple of slides coming forward. And whenever I give a trigger warning, I like to say to folks, if the conversation I bring up here, because it is about mental health and some of this is heavy, if it is triggering to you or difficult for you, please give yourself some space, take a step back, you know, um, you know, and, and join us again whenever you're able to. Now, this particular publication, and this, mind you, is all before the pandemic. This is still 2019. And I was tracking in the lab a series of deaths by suicide that I had um, been made aware of in our general area here in Northern California that were all Muslim and who were all immigrants or asylum seekers. And the news around this topic and around the, the, the charge, as some of you who are in kind of the policy and, and the legal field know, is a policy that's not new to the Trump administration, but definitely the Trump administration really bolstered it a whole lot more, was the policy called inadmissibility, you know, on public charge. So it's called, you know, the public charge uh, policy. And what it means is that a person who was deemed to be a public charge, meaning they kind of took up resources um, uh, from the general public, they would be deemed inadmissible for full U.S. citizenship. And this alarmed so many different people in different communities, particularly people who could not read or understand English very uh, easily. And there's so much red tape and, you know, nuance to this policy of who is exempt from it and who is not. And it turns out, you know, that refugees and asylum seekers are in fact exempt from this policy. But that's not 
was not easily understood. And as you know, so much in the last administration, things would just get blasted on social media with very little explanation. And it put a lot of alarm for so many communities, because what it means when you are a public charge, it means that you're somebody who's using public resources, such as, you know, food aid, right? Such as, you know, public uh, uh, medical resources, such as mental health resources. So these deaths by suicide that I was tracking were all one after another had to do with folks who had accessed the public health and public mental health systems, right, to get help and care. They were needing that, of course, as they came from places of trauma and sought out asylum and then heard, you know, and without very little, with very little explanation and lots, no, not much nuance that they would possibly be exempt, uh, sorry, it would not be, um, be inadmissible for receiving U.S. citizenship. And they thought, and here they are kind of escaping from, you know, violence and trauma and difficulty for what they hope to be the land of opportunity and stability, only to be told you cannot be a citizen here and we will extradite you back to your country. Well, this is what they assumed or thought. And so many of them said, well, that's a life not worth living. I don't want to go back to where I came from and I sought asylum from. And so there were multiple deaths by suicide. And that was very unfortunate because as you see here, the story that I'm kind of telling and painting is kind of different pockets of our Muslim communities that are being affected by so much of that very explicit Islamophobia, and also by rules and policies that affected even people well outside of our communities, but also affected us too, and in very detrimental ways. And so, you know, we continue to kind of add and add to the story. And of course, as you all know, once we enter into, um, you know, the following year, the pandemic's going to come, and that's going to really uh, really kick up even more kind of mental health considerations. But we'll pause for a second and talk about this concept of Islamophobia that I know many of you are well familiar with, particularly those who are familiar with the good work of care. And to think about what it means when you have this very anti-Islamic hatred that's widespread and a distrust of Muslims that's become widespread. And it kind of, um, you know, goes beyond age, education, partisan affiliation, right? It's kind of widespread throughout the society regardless. And we felt that there really needed to be a documentation on how um, Islamophobia was affecting the mental health of our communities. And there was no such thing. Most clinicians you spoke to could tell you anecdotally that there was a direct effect between Islamophobia and mental health. But there wasn't any proof. There wasn't anything in the literature. And as you know, in modern day kind of, you know, science and practice, if it's not in the literature, if you cannot cite it and point to it there, it's as though it doesn't exist. So we took on an endeavor to actually, you know, write a full comprehensive, in this case, a book. We actually wrote an entire book on the topic of Islamophobia and psychiatry. And I was one of the editors of this uh, book. And there are many, many, you know, contributors and really to document the direct link between the two. And this was very important because until you can document it and it can be cited, right? You're not going to be able to change policy. You're not gonna be able to change actual work related to even clinicians who are doing this kind of care, right? Um, it needed to actually you know, happen. And if you take a look at how Islamophobia was winning, it wasn't just because of that particular administration. We're talking about decades and decades and decades worth of policies that have had Islamophobic tendencies towards them, right? And I won't, you know, we have to be able to very clearly speak and say that even um, in care reports, which I really appreciated because there was that documentation, uh, not in academic literature yet, but just the general documentation on how so much of these policies, so many of these policies had, a, had effects on increased anxiety, increased hate crimes, increased trauma, right, for so much uh, for so many fact, members of our communities. And it's on so many different levels, everything from individuals. So either you have personally, some of you here have personally experienced this or have know of other individuals who've experienced this. Also interpersonally, 
you know, other people in our, either our jobs or our social networks. And depending on what kind of social networks and um, supports that we have really played a part in whether or not we were doing okay. Then there's community factors, whether you think about like, you know, image on the media uh, and media outlets, or whether you think about kind of resources or the lack thereof in our Islamic community centers, in our schools and universities, right? There's a lot of there where you say, okay, we understand there's this Islamophobia. We understand that there is an effect of it. What is actually being done to help remedy or heal our communities? And then, of course, on the policy level, which we spoke to just um, a little bit ago. So this is all the way, right? We kind of went through 17, 18, 2019, and now we enter into the next stage, 2020. And the pandemic of course hits um, and, and, and you know, lockdown and quarantine and all of the mental health ramifications. We often speak of the pandemic, um, which we are currently still in, as uh, that there are going to be, and there has been a significant portion of, our, of all people, in all communities that have been affected, you know, by this physically, uh, medically, financially, but even more of us, probably the majority, if not all, have been affected on a mental health level. And if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's how much we have probably been dealing with various mental health considerations and not actually doing much about them, either because of barriers or stigma right, access to care, or just our own, you know, brushing it off, I can do this, I can do this, I need to be strong, or sometimes also relying on faith. Now, speaking of faith, what we decided to do is um, a very large study, what became a very large study on Muslims and COVID-19. Very interesting study. In fact, it's probably the, glo the, the largest study done on this topic. And globally, we were able to recruit um, about 10,000 people to be part of the study. It's a huge study um, with partners uh, with the Yaqeen Institute. And what we found was some really interesting things. First of all, as you all remember, we went into the pandemic in 2020. It was right before Ramadan. You might remember right before Ramadan of 2020. And Ramadan, as you know, is a very communal month. It's a month where there's a lot of, you know, gathering and breaking fast together and praying together and so on and so forth. So there was a lot of angst you know, with that too, even on a spiritual level. And so we tested and sent out these, um, in this survey in multiple stages. One was right before Ramadan, one was right after Ramadan, and we did some checkpoints later in the year and even into 2021. What I can tell you from this very large study is that Muslims, like every other group, interestingly enough, including communities of no faith, uh, actually increased their levels of religiosity in the pandemic, their reliance on either we say God, others might call a, a kind of a higher power. Um, the Pew Research Study did something very similar and found that in April of 2020, 24% of Americans felt their faith had strengthened since the pandemic. Now we compared this in our own study with Muslims and found that nearly 70% of Muslims recorded having a improved relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is really interesting because that number is drastically higher than the general population, which really makes us think there's something very special about, you know, the faith as Islam as it is and the kind of um, protective factors that it can give, right, to communities and people who uh, hold on to that, right? And certainly there's so much um, uncertainty that came up in the pandemic that holding on to faith had been, has been a very important factor for Muslims. Now, this concept of uncertainty that I just brought up, brought up another really interesting uh, finding in our study, which I'll share with you briefly, and that is a direct clinical correlation. If you remember, I said almost everybody has been affected mental health-wise by this pandemic, either because of the isolation or because of close quarters during the quarantine or the transitions to having to work from home and for a long time kids were schooling at home, um, needing to, feeling distanced from your relatives, whether they were elderly or others who were ill and couldn't be with them. There were so many different reasons why a person could be suffering from this anxiety that comes with uncertainty. What we found is that the more people had uncertainty, intolerance, the ability to, you know, not be able to handle uncertainty, the more likely they would develop major depressive disorder 
or MDD by 60%. And there's a direct clinical correlation with if a person had more tolerance for uncertainty. And when you ask, where does a person get that more tolerance from? For many, it comes from the faith. <laughs> they were relying on this concept of tawakkul or relying on God, realizing that certainty is only in God's hands. And because Islam gives that very clear messaging, right, it turned out that that was actually very protective for people. And so, and those who didn't quite have that, their chances for increased uh, major depressive disorder went up by 60%. So that's really kind of striking and important of this whole story that we're going to tell. Because it's a story of a community, us as Muslims, as communities that have, have suffered quite a bit. As I was kind of outlining from 2017 onwards, but really the reality is decades onwards. Um, lots of difficulties, lots of, you know, you know uh, demeaning us as a community and so on. But there are also positives and there's also strength that comes from the faith itself. And that's why tying this discussion of Muslim mental health becomes a very important part of the discussion. And you see here, when we asked about Ramadan, the COVID-19 kind of Ramadan experience, one of the most amazing things we found in the study we totally not expected was that we thought, you know, so many people were complaining of angst, right, for that Ramadan. And now we've had two in COVID, heading into a third, subhanAllah. But interestingly enough, we found in that first study um, that first Ramadan, that 73% of Muslims reporting having a better Ramadan than they did the year previous. And that was really, really striking. You know, something about being able to turn inward and be more introspective and not have, you know, the, the ideals of Ramadan, like the actual point of it, right? Um, and being able to do that and really taking a lot of that uncertainty and channeling it into prayer and channeling it into dua and charity and so on. Uh, was actually very uh, a protective for so many and actually reported a better Ramadan overall. So worth kind of holding on to that point and thinking, thinking about it, inshallah. Now, I said before that as we continue kind of going through the timeline here, I would bring up, and now for the next several slides, I have a trigger warning on a very difficult kind of subject that continues to come up and the, top, the subject of, of suicide. And the reason for that is because our lab and myself have done quite a bit of work around the topic of suicide in particular. As I mentioned, this is something that has been uh, striking actually more recently in the Muslim community. So as we enter now into 2021, a few months into the year, earlier this year, there was an incident that I'm sure many of you were well aware of. It kind of caught national headlines and it was very, very tragic and uh, very difficult for so many of us to process, but it brought up some very, it almost it kind of hit the hit the head on um, key things that were happening in the community, but not very much spoken about, not at least not clearly. And this is a story or a case, as you may remember, that came out of Texas. And it was a very tragic murder-suicide that happened for an entire family that lost their lives. Uh, two brothers who had mental illness, undertreated, and uh, not having good support systems who made a pact together and according to their you know note um, decided to take their lives and the lives of all of their family members and it's very important to make the note that there was not the kind of mental health support and help for these young men and one might wonder if that was in place if a tragedy like this could have been avoided wallahu alam but it's important to say because what happened next in the broader kind of American Muslim sphere was a lot of discussion points that came up. And in years previous to this incident, I had been called in by many uh, other Muslim communities to do what we call postvention response, which is basically your crisis response in the aftermath of a suicide in a person's location. And to do this for Muslim communities. So, of course, in this case, too, was called in kind of within 24 hours, had um, all of the Dallas imams kind of on the line, was training them, and also the local Muslim mental health clinicians training them and others, you know, leaders to be able to help the community process this very difficult incident and also to process the, the, the grief that comes with this and really the questions that all come up with this. So, this corresponds with some work that we had been doing in the lab actually for a number of years. For about five years prior to this incident, 
we had been working on um, research on Muslims and suicide. The reason we did this is because, as mentioned, I had, you know, for many years now, had done all these postvention response trainings for various communities, usually on the quiet and on the down low, usually not quite as, you know, a uh, headliner as this particular story. But it became very, very clear to me that this was just happening more and more and more. And there needed to be uh, a manual, literally like a training manual for how it is we can train our imams, our community leaders, our youth directors, and so on and so forth in appropriate suicide response. And in, in general, and more that's more particular, and then in general, a mental health response for our communities. And so you might have heard that later in this uh, year, as we go into July of this year, we published a very important study. It's published in JAMA. Uh, JAMA is the Journal of American Medical Association. It's one of the highest level journals, similar to our previous Lancet publication. And it was focused on also on the topic of suicide, but this time we did something which um, really kind of provoked a lot of attention, I think. And it's essentially a cross-sectional study, which means that we compared Muslims to other faith and non-faith communities, Christians, Jews, atheists, agnostics, Hindus, Buddhists, basically folks of all these other faith or non-faiths. And we compared attempts, lifetime attempts of suicide of Muslims to these other folks. And we were really, on one hand, surprised. We did not think it was going to be this high. Like clinically and anecdotally, we had a sense, because as I tell you, all these cases that I was dealing with and other clinicians like me have been dealing with, but didn't quite think it was this high. And other, um, but in other ways, it did make sense, given all the story I just shared from the beginning of the talk till now, right? That there's so much stress on so many people, members of this community. And we found that in when you compare it to some of the faith groups, sometimes it's nearly double or more suicide attempts of Muslims compared to other faiths or non-faith groups. This was alarming. This really rung, if you will, the alarm bells. For so many, there were so many discussion points around this topic. Of course, the question comes up all the time, why? Why is this the case? And what is to be done about it? And it garnered enough attention that I can share with you kind of like a little bit of the, of the actual survey because people often ask, what is this? This particular study, our lab does a lot of collaborative work. I mentioned the Yaqeen Institute earlier. This particular study was done in collaboration with the ISPU, the Institute of Social Policy and Understanding, part of their annual Muslim poll. And I should also mention to you that this data was taken pre-COVID, pre-pandemic. And we are now in the Chal and the next year, kind of launching the next lit level or stage of the data to see are things the same or worsened since the pandemic? And as you probably can guess between you and I, what we think is probably what we're going to see. May Allah spawns out to protect all of our communities, but it is a very difficult um, thing, but a very important thing to study and analyze. Also, um, as I mentioned here, you can see the different faith groups, some of them that we studied, and you can see how the numbers are larger in the Muslim populations. Now, this conversation garnered a lot of attention. Uh, JAMA actually ended up sending us uh, data on how far spread the conversations went. This map actually shows kind of Twitter demographics, if you will, of folks who were tweeting and talking about this particular topic. This next slide shows you that, you know, there were 77 news stories on 72 different news outlets about this particular study. And, um, you know, in terms of the research and on the academic side, that this was, an, this article hit kind of 5% of all research studies because it was such a large finding, if you will. And this all then brings up the topic of why, how come, what's happening? Well, some of it I've already shared, which is basically two main things that we need to think about when you think about suicide. And one of them is a thwarted sense of belonging when a person doesn't feel they belong. And the other one is increased sense of burdensomeness. When a person feels that they are a burden on their family, their friends, the society, if that's what the media keeps telling you, right? 
And the, the thwarted sense of belonging, the not feeling belonging, could happen, of course, on a family or on a, you know, on a friend level, if you will, school level, university level, but can also happen on a society level. And these are two very important things that need to be continued studied and to kind of really look at. And that's exactly what we're hoping to do next. We're hoping actually we have um, a grant that's just come through from the John Templeton Foundation, which is one of the foundations interested in religion and science, one of the few, I should say. And we said to them, look, everything we can see from the pandemic and that research that we did and other studies that we have done about Muslim communities, we find that there's a lot of protective factors. In fact, even on the topic of suicide, and this is a very important point, we find that deaths by suicide, which is not a study we did, we did suicide attempts. You could see how they're connected, but they're not the same. And when you look at deaths by suicide in the literature by other people that have done that work, you find that Muslims are always at the bottom of that list, meaning the least to die by suicide. But we were very alarmed that if you have twice the number of attempts, you will, that will eventually translate it to deaths by suicide too, right? But still, there is something that we need to explain the discrepancy between the two things. And that's where we said, look, we need to have a study that looks at what are the preventative factors, the protective factors that are Islam inspired. And that's our research study that just um, has started this past uh, September, actually, we're two months in, and some very important uh, work that's underway on that very topic. But we also decided we actually need to have, other than the academic work, which is very important to explain how and the why and the mechanics, there needs to be community responses. And we launched a website that I hope all of you will visit. The, the link is at the bottom of this slide. Um, and it's a new nonprofit organization called Madistan. And Madistan is, I'll just share with you the meaning of it, because people often ask, what is the Madistan? And what does it stand for? And it's the shortened word of be Madistan. Now, for many of the languages, for those of you who speak Farsi or Urdu, you know that Bimar is the person who is ill, someone who's sick. And Stan, of course, is the place of. So historically, in Muslim history, which I'll talk about very soon in more detail, the Bimaristan is the place or location of where an ill person would go to get healing and treatments. And in Arabic, the word is Darashifa. Same idea the place of healing, right? An institution of healing. And we decided to call the new organization Madistan, which is Bimaristan shortened. In English, they often use just the Madistan. Um, and to launch this new website in order to have mental health resources for Muslims, developed directly by our lab at the Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab, um, but actually give very helpful and practical advice on what to do. And we have a whole page dedicated just to the topic of suicide in Muslim communities, where there's articles like the ones we published in Muslim Matters on the do's and don'ts of suicide response and postvention and prevention kind of response. We also created khutbahs like full khutbahs that imams and other khatibs can read at the Juma khutbah for suicide prevention, such as September is Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month. We really recommend masajid and community centers make sure that they have talks on this topic, particularly if none other part of time of the year than at least in September. And then in the unfortunate, if there is an unfortunate aftermath of the suicide in someone's community, that grieving and response, there's actually khutbahs we've written for that as well. This is all free and downloadable on our website, which I hope all of you will look at and more resources to come. Now, we also launched something called the 500 Imams campaign. And I won't click on the link, but it's an awesome video. I hope you go to the website and take a look at this video. It's very short, it's just three minutes long, but it is powerful. And it's the faces of so many Imams that you probably will recognize some of our, mashallah, more famous Imams and Ustadas, um, and then who all at some point or another attended a post vention training with me and came together to do this campaign that is currently running that I hope all of you will support inshallah because we do need the funding to be able to support this campaign to train our imams, our community leaders, our youth directors, our MSA leaders, any our board members, anybody who interfaces in a point of leadership with the Muslim community and how to train them with appropriate suicide response. So what did we do? We took the manual I was telling you about that we took many years to write and create, which is evidence-based. It is directly connected, uh, the most up-to-date scientific 
you know, your cutting edge kind of methods in working with suicide, but marry that or coupled it with Islamic ethics, morals, and techniques. Why is that important? Because everything I would find out there was either too secular and our religious leaders were not interested in it, couldn't relate to it, or felt it wasn't Islamic, uh, or didn't have kind of the right responses. Um, it was either too secular, or it was made for other faith communities, and it wasn't exactly adapted for Muslims. There are things that are very, very unique and specific to us. The way we, you know, the whole end of life kind of rites and rituals that we do are very specific to Muslims. Our khutbah is how we pray the janazah prayer, how we bury a person, praying for a person. All these things are very Muslim specific. So alhamdulillah, we took our man Manual, which is over 100 pages, and inshallah, once it's completely published, it too will be free and a resource on the website. But then we created trainings. And the trainings is part of this 500 Imam campaign that I'm telling you about that I hope you'll support. And it's full day long certification training for Imams. We're hoping that in 2022 that we train at least 500 Imams, religious leaders, community leaders. And then our five-year goal with the new data ISP came out with saying that there's 3,000 masajid in America many of whom are your own messages that are listening in, we hope to train all of them in our five-year goal. So please, inshallah, make dua for us and support us because I feel so strongly about this topic. As you see, it's a major theme. Oops, hang on. So, Assalamu alaikum oh, wa rahmatullahi It's deciding to play. There goes Sheikh Yes. Thank you so much, inshallah. <laughs> you can watch the video, inshallah, on your, on your own time. I won't take uh, this talk for it. But we'll really think about these kind of lessons and takeaways, right? What is this research uh, that's important that needs to happen? Well, we need to know what's happening to the mental health of our communities. What do we need to do after that? The actions. Really take quick actions to really make sure that our families and our communities are helped. And then prevention work, because I have to tell you this since we talked about suicide, of all the mental health considerations we can talk about today, suicide is one that is 100% preventable with the correct support and measures. So I want you to hear that clearly, that if people know how to respond, right, intervention, or even better, if they've put preventative measures in place, you know, we don't have to get all the way in for the unfortunate aftermath, but that too will continue to happen because life will continue to happen in that way. And we have to be ready for post pension response. It shouldn't be a scramble, you know, to be able to figure out how to help our communities or how to help our individuals within our communities that are having a hard time. And that's where the customized trainings come in. And I hope inshallah, you'll, you'll kind of take a good look at those very soon. So the question comes then as we kind of, close the gap of this particular conversation. And uh, I have, you know, a few more slides here to kind of share, because then the question comes up, how do we bridge this gap? What do we do? What next? Okay, we heard you, Dr. Rania, this is the, 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 all these troubles and all these difficulties and the very terrible news around even the topic of suicide. What now, right? So here's what I want to say. Number one, the important thing is there's three steps, okay? The first is, understanding mental health. If we continue to have this stigma against mental health and lack of wanting, it's kind of like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> but when it comes to you or your own family members, it's like, no, 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 no. no. We're not going to go there. We don't want that on your records. No, 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 no. Those people don't know what they're doing. Um, or, or better yet, I often hear this. Muslims don't need that. Muslims don't, you know, subhanAllah, I, would, I just presented all this data and we still get people saying, no, 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 Muslims don't need that. Or coming from a faith perspective, people will say, well, if you just had strong enough iman, you don't need to go to a therapist. You don't need, you know, to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist and so on. Discounting completely that there could be biological factors, environmental factors, genetic hereditary factors hormonal factors, you know, all of these things are the same factors we talk about for heart disease, for diabetes, for strokes, for any other medical condition. Yet when we come to hear a mental health, people go, hm. they kind of just put the blinders on and go, no, no, not relevant to us. Or pray more, make dua more, have better iman. Yet it's the same. Sometimes it's literally a genetic hereditary thing. And they're saying the same things. I'm the last person to tell you don't pray more. You know I'm also a religious leader, right? Like I'm the last person to tell you don't pray or don't pray more, right? But I have to tell you that sometimes, you know, you look squarely in the eyes of somebody who has themselves or their family member dealing with 
a clearly, you know, either, you know, let's say environmental mental health condition. Let's say there, there was no biology or history of family, anything, but they just came from a traumatized situation, either some trauma that happened to them personally, or maybe the or country of origin from which they came from. We have so many immigrants to the U.S. here from our Muslim communities, and they experience so much trauma. And nothing is dealt with, nothing is processed. And they keep on carrying that from generation to generation. Why? Because there's such a thing called intergenerational trauma. So even your kids who are first generation Americans here, or even second or third, can have that trauma too, or portions of it, when the parents haven't processed their own because of this concept of intergenerational trauma, but they can do genetic markers and actually find that. Can you believe it, subhanAllah? Anyhow. This kind of concept of denying that there is mental health A concerns in our community, which I hope I've dispelled in the first part of the talk, and also denying that Muslims have anything to do with mental health is majorly problematic because the first thing it does is this slide right here. It denies our heritage, our history, the fact that Muslims were the very first people in humanity, to our knowledge, to create Maristans, hospitals, healing centers that what? Integrated mental health into the topic. People are often amazed when I say this, but you have to know, I hope you hear this talk clearly, that the first psychiatric wards in the world, to our knowledge, were built and designed in Muslim lands. And that's not a coincidence. It's part of the holistic understanding of healing and health that Islam brings. This concept of mind, body, soul. And this is not a new age thing. This is something our scholars, and I'll show you some of them in a moment here, wrote about extensively. And you can, and so that when they created healing, hosp healing hospitals and centers, they didn't separate mind, body, soul. They built institutions that were holistic and had all of them in it. And that meant you weren't just going to go to the healing center if your leg broke, but not be able to go there if you had some depression or anxiety. You see why now? Muslims were the first to have the first psychiatric wards because they had a holistic understanding of healing and health. And it comes directly from the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and, and from our Islamic understandings. Because there's a hadith, and it's a very famous hadith, and I love it so much, and I remind people of it, where the Prophet وسلم, says, Seek out treatments, O servants of Allah. As in to say, if Allah gave you an illness, part of doing your tawakkul or reliance on Allah, part of that is tying your own camel first. And part of tying your camel is going to seek out the treatments that have been designed and created for this. Fast forward to 2021, here we are, right? And COVID vaccines have come out and people in our communities are saying, no, no, no. And it's like, this is part, Allah has sent us a pandemic, but he's also sent us knowledge and science to figure out how to you know, protect ourselves. Anyway, back to historical understandings, same concept, right? That the Muslims were very interested and inspired from Islam directly to seek out cures and to create amazing institutions that I could probably talk on for a whole hour, but I'll spare you for a different day on a different time to be able to treat all types of illnesses, including mental illness. And I remind you that this is the same period of time in Europe and I don't like the concept of the, the terms golden age and dark ages. They're kind of, you know, old terms that are misused. But generally speaking, this is a period of time in Europe where across the way in the same time period, Muslims are having this amazing flourishing and these beautiful institutions and hospitals being created. Uh, the Madistans, that at the same time you have in Europe, the mentally ill are being burned at the stake as witches, are sent to monasteries because the understanding this is purely spiritual. Right? And Muslims are light, age, light ages ahead of them, you know, leaps and bounds ahead of them. And to think this is our heritage, and why have we gone backwards, right, from what we used to have? And you have to understand that today, this concept of modern psychology, which people get very upset about, when they think about modern psychology, what they're thinking of is Western psychology. They're thinking of Freud and the rest, which is very much outdated now. What they're not realizing is there's a whole movement on Islamic psychology that's now emerged slowly but surely, alhamdulillah. And this concept is integrating Islamic principles into therapy, drawing from the Quran and the Sunnah and our Islamic intellectual heritage 
to help and heal our psychological needs. Alhamdulillah, excuse me, <laughs> mashallah. And when you think about how that um, kind of relates to modern psychology, you see that there needs to be um, more than just what we call very empirical or rational studies of psychology. And Muslims were really great in bringing in the empirical and the rational, yes, but also the metaphysical and scriptural, kind of relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his revelation to really help fully heal a person. And this is why for so many Muslims, when they go to therapy today, they say, okay, fine, I'll go to therapy. But it seems very... A, it's very secular, and it feels very distant from me. And this is why, because it doesn't tie the whole story in. But I'll tell you, something is better than nothing. MashaAllah, professional is someone who's trained to help you. But even more so why it's so important that we have Muslims who are trained in their deen, who are, you know, bringing Islamic principles in to be able to be the therapist for our community, because there's a cultural and a spiritual relevance that they bring um, that's important. And very quickly, I'll show you just a few seconds. It's always a wowing kind of factor when you look at the number of people who wrote from our heritage and tradition on, um, uh, on this topic of Islamic psychology, whether it's the philosophers like Al-Kindi or Ibn Mishkaway or Al-Farabi, Ibn Rushd, right? And how much they wrote, whether it's something like Kindi's work on you know, repelling sorrows and depression, for example, which is amazing, right? Or whether you look at the theologians, Imam al-Ghazali, Zahra Wendi, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim, all of whom wrote extensively on understanding the human psyche and what makes us tick, subhanAllah. Or you look at the physicians, right? Like Al-Razi or Ibn Sina, right? The doctor of doctors, mashallah, or my favorite, Al-Balkhi. And Al-Balkhi, you know, I'll tell you something about him. I have some papers that I wrote about him that became really kind of landmark in our field. Because what was so amazing to me is that you have scholars from our Islamic heritage in the past who not only recognize mental health conditions, wrote about it, and then did what I call the proof in the pudding, created healing institutions or madistans to heal those who are dealing with mental health issues. But in addition to that, what they brought forward was so, uh, you know, this word precocious genius, really way ahead of their time. And Al-Balkhi was somebody who I really uh, spent a lot of time with in my work, early in my research when I was first training at Stanford, it was a fellow. Uh, I, you know, I did this research study about the early scholars to see what they were all saying, and came across Al Balkhi, and I was blown away. This is before anything was translated about him, before you even found his name in English literature. Nothing really about his name wasn't even very much known. And um, I came across in his book where he talks about different illnesses, and I'll just say very briefly to you, the illness today that we call obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD, and also the chapter of that he writes about phobias. To me, as a modern as a modern day trained psychiatrist, I'm reading this going, oh my God, Balkhi figured it out in the ninth century. And our books of the history of psychology that you read when you take Psych 101, tells you say, OCD is a new illness only fully fleshed out in the 19th century. And attributed, of course, to some European person. And to me, this needed to be rewritten. The story needed to be rewritten. Wallahi, and look, this I'll show you exactly what I mean. This is a Balkhi's book now translated by Dr. Malik Badri. May Allah have mercy on him. He just passed away this year. Um, as Sustenance of the Body and Soul. He, he did the soul part, the second half of the book. So please take a look at that when you have a chance, inshallah. But look at this paper. This is taken directly from my paper. Look at this. I put the criteria Al-Balkhi used to, uh, to diagnose obsessions and the criteria that today as modern day psychiatrists, we diagnose from something called the DSM. The DSM is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Psychiatry. And all clinicians have to take these criteria to say whether or not a person currently has OCD. And as I'm reading ninth century old, old work in Balkhi, I thought to myself, Ya Allah, he has exactly what we have in the DSM. I pulled out my DSM and did a cross-by-cross -cross comparison so you can look on both sides of the slide here. And you'll see what I mean. I was amazed, blown away. Because we're not talking about just a few decades off or a few centuries off. We're talking about a millennium 
off. And this needed to be rewritten. History needed to be rewritten. And in short, long story short, when I submitted this for publication, it took a very long time because they called it unorthodox. Here I am trying to turn over history, right? But eventually they had historians of medicine review this paper. And when they finally finished their review and they wrote back to us, they said, this work overturns the history of psychology and psychiatry. It proves that Muslims contributed immensely to the field of mental health. And so much so that it's the same kind of treatments we use today in the modern era. When you look at something like obsessions or on phobias, which are the two papers I wrote on Al-Balkhi. And I, to me, this was not just a win, Alhamdulillah, <laughs> but it was a clear, you know, firm grounding in what it means when Muslims reject the concept of mental health, or they say this is not for us, or it's not part of our heritage. And I say, no, 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 no. It's very much part of our heritage. And the early Muslims didn't have an issue or stigma with it like we have today, right? They had issues, we have issues. But they also took the hadith, right? To Dawa Ibad Allah, seek out treatments, right? Get treatments, get cures, and figure out how to treat the ill, right? SubhanAllah. So I hope, inshallah, you are inspired by this like I have been. And this research continues in our lab. You know, one of the lines of research continues to be the historical understandings of Islamic, uh, from Islamic past and heritage and reviving it. And our logo, of course, our, our, our tag, our tag, our tag uh, line at Maristan is to, right, revive our legacy, reclaim our heritage, and to rewrite the narrative, right, around mental health. So that's one, one key thing. I said there were three. Very quickly here. Number two is trainings. And I mentioned this already. It's going to be really, really important that there are clinicians, whether they be Muslim or not Muslim, who help, who learn and train specifically on how to work with Muslim communities. We developed multiple resources. Many of these are free. They, for example, this is one I co-wrote um, on the American Psychiatric Association called the Stress and Trauma Toolkit on working with U.S. Muslims and really went through the number of issues that I already talked to you about today earlier. And it's a toolkit for clinicians of what they can do to help, right? And we created kind of all kinds of treatment recommendations for them to think through. And even now, alhamdulillah, also writing, uh, completed a CME, for those of you familiar with the medical system and, you know, a system, there's continuing education or continuing medical education. Alhamdulillah, just completed a whole training, uh, reporting for this kind of training on Muslim mental health for non-Muslim clinicians, but also Muslim clinicians can take this as well. And a number of books that are coming out very soon. Um, the APA has also asked me to work on a textbook on Muslim mental health, which is hopefully coming out in the coming year, inshallah. And alhamdulillah, a number of resources that we've been able to complete with the lab or with partnerships with other folks, um, like the suicide training manual that I was referring to, the suicide response uh, training, but also to think about, you know, how do you integrate Islam into psychotherapy? So this is a new book we've just published on applying Islamic principles to clinical mental health care. I always like to leave folks with resources of what they can do and where they can go next inshallah. So this is an image of just the number of different books and resources we've either published or are in process, inshallah, for publication with your du'as and your support. And lastly is access. Where do you refer members of the community who need help? How do you know where to send people when you listen to a lecture like this? How do you know where to send your friends and your family or yourselves? And alhamdulillah, there's many more resources than there have ever been in the past now. If the pandemic brought us anything, it has brought us telehealth, subhanAllah, and telemental health. And there is a, on our website, if you, if you access maristan.org backslash resources, you'll find a list of directories, a whole list of directories. Some of them are state specific and some of them are general across the US on Muslims who are professionals in mental health. Therapists, psychologists, counselors, social workers, psychiatrists. So I encourage you to visit the website and check out the directories if you're ever looking for particular resources on this. And, you know, we can drop this uh, link for you in the chat as well with the madistan.org backslash resources. And then I encourage you, inshallah, to A, stay in touch. So we put some of our 
contact information here for both myself, the Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab, and of course, Maristan. And also encouraging you, inshallah, to reach out if your communities want to be trained, for example, like the suicide response training certificate training, or, uh, or for example, general mental health, Muslim mental health trainings. Um, if this is something you're interested in, you're welcome to be in touch with us at info at maristan.org. And then in general, just kind of supporting the campaigns and the work that's happening. And at the very least, kind of accessing the free resources that are on these web on the website in order to really better help, the, help your communities, inshallah. And with that, I'll close and see if there's any discussion or questions. Barakallahu feekum. Wassalamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Rania. I'll jump in until Mr. Daria, Mr. Christine um, jump in. With so we have quite a number of questions that came in both in the chat here in the Q and A and also on Facebook Live. Um, so I'll pass to Mr. Christine and Mr. Daria. Assalamualaikum. So we do have a question um, from Facebook, and the question is, would spiritual treatment like Rokia heal mental illness? And what does the historical data say on that type of treatment? Great question. So definitely the Rukia is something that is well known at the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that was used. And um, for those who are not too familiar with what Rukia means, in short, kind of a long story short, um, it's the use of Quranic verses either in directly um, that a person could directly do, or they go to somebody who is more learned to be able to, you know, put together verses for them to read for themselves or upon themselves to heal uh, uh, themselves, basically, from really any illness, not just the mental health illness. So in this, what we would say, just like when people ask, you know, can um, can a treatment like this be used completely alone? So I kind of turn the question back and say, look, would you do Rukya on your diabetic grandparent completely alone? And most of the time person says, no, we would take them to a medical doctor and make sure their blood sugar wasn't out of control. As you know, it's deathly, right? Literally a person could collapse and completely die if their diabetes is out of control. Same thing if a person had a stroke. Then I say, okay, can you use the medical treatment that the, that the doctor gave you? Maybe they told you to take insulin or metformin and some other form of medication, uh, along with the ruqya. And most people say, yes, sure. And my answer to that is, this is exactly what I would say for mental health too. Use the spiritual considerations along with the scientific and medical treatments that Allah has made for you. It is part of our deen, literally, to take the means and measures that Allah has actually put in our place, right? And put in our, uh, as resources for us. So I hope that kind of clarifies things. I will never be the person that says, don't do the ruqya, right? But at the same time, if somebody says, is this the only thing or should we do this alone? Well, now you know my answer too, right? Inshallah. Thank, Thank you, so Dr. Adlan. This is Doria. Thank you so much. You touched on so many important themes, and I feel like I learned so much from this talk today. So thank you so much. There's one question that I think you did address, but um, I see it on the chat here. Um, how can the Muslim community leaders get the training that you had mentioned? Right. So inshallah, the best way to do this is if a person goes to the website maristan.org, and we can probably put the link to the exact place on the suicide response trainings. And what they would do is they would get in contact with us. There's a form that you can fill on our main site and uh, be in touch with us or directly kind of email the info at maristan.org. Um, and what it would require is that a person, it would have to be a group. Usually I would mention like a group of masajid or a group of community centers come together because there is a minimum requirement for the trainings for one of, for myself or any of the trainers to kind of fly out and to be able to do the training. And we require that um, a third of those participants be imams, religious leaders. So usually it means kind of working with your local, let's say shura council or imams group council or something like that to pull in several of the Muslim leaders. By 
by the way, when I say imam, I mean male and female. So I also mean ustadas and women religious leaders, inshallah. So both. And um, and then your other types of leaders in the Muslim community, whether they be youth leaders or board members or teachers, Sunday school teacher, any, anybody who's interfacing directly with Muslim community members can be part of the training as well. So that's what they do, inshallah. And we can put the link here shortly for folks to... And, and Dr. Um, Avad, how long is that training for? It's a full day training. It's an eight it's hour day. Okay. full day certification training. Yes. I actually had one question. So, you know, you had mentioned um, suicide attempts and the mis, um, misalignment that the data is showing us between the suicide attempts and um, the actual suicides. So I was very intrigued by that. Is that because you had done the research as a Muslim on the suicide attempts and what happened with the suicides? Um, was it because somebody like you had not done the research? Is that why we had that misalignment? No, not at all. The um, the research that's been done on deaths by suicide, I think that's what you're referring to, yes. is global research that's been repeated multiple times over in global settings. Um, nothing like as recent as this year, but in, in the recent past, the study these studies have been uh, done. And when they do interfaith comparisons so across faiths, they find that Muslims have the lowest, so far as we know, deaths by suicide, alhamdulillah. The worry and the concern is when we see this massive increase in suicide attempts, and as you know, it, it, sometimes when people attempt, it might take multiple attempts before a, the unfortunate death by suicide. So we worry when there's such a massive spike in attempts, it could also mean translate over to increased deaths by suicide. So there's that consideration to worry about. Um, but there could very well also be very protective means, something about the Islamic belief system and theology that may prevent people from dying by suicide. So, okay, so the attempts are still high, but yes, the deaths are, are, okay, maybe we need more um, research. We absolutely need more research, that's exactly right. And yeah. as you know, research and resources are not easy to come by. So if anybody is listening to this and inspired, we are more than welcome to you know, either have people who are interested in helping with the actual work and research or or even just if they're not themselves scientists or researchers to, um, you know, uh, sponsor this kind of work, inshallah. I don't see any other questions. Emma, do we have any other questions on Facebook? Um, there is, a, so Christine, do you want to comment a question from our listener who is tuning in from France? Um, I actually have a, I see a question that was actually put into the chat. Um, this is Assalamu alaikum. My ex-husband committed suicide. He was a Muslim and many in the community felt the need to tell me what a sin he had committed. Can you please share the Quranic or Islamic understanding of suicide as it relates to mental illness? I know that his illness led to his decision to complete suicide. I think this is a big part of why it's still taboo and misunderstood. Thank you very much for your wisdom. Yeah, I'm really, really sorry for your loss. The person who's writing this, I'm very, very sorry for your loss. And this is exactly why we felt very strongly, actually, that we needed to have um, this training that I'm referring to that is evidence-based, but also very much grounded in Islamic morals, ethics, and understanding. Why? It's precisely for questions like this. Because you're going to have community members who are looking at things very, very literal, as in to say, and I'm not going to mince words, let me be very, very, very clear. If somebody asks for the Islamic ruling, that is directly written in the Qur'an. However, what the Qur'an and Islam in general also allows for is understanding every individual's personal circumstances, which only Allah alone knows. And that's very important. This is why we did the trainings, the way the manual and now the, the certificate trainings, the khutbahs or sermons. This is why we created them, because we found exactly this kind of sentiment that the, this individual mentions, where, you know, people are either, uh, it's really suicide is like a taboo within a taboo. It's a, it's a taboo within the broader kind of mental health taboo. And so you find people just shun it completely. But they say, no, no, sin, 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 wrong, wrong, wrong. And sometimes you find that even the very last rituals and rites of a Muslim, like being you know washed, buried, and the prayer for them, the janazah prayer, the people asking, can I even make du'a for them? All of this confusion 
And it's unfortunate because the dean or the religion itself gives very clear understandings of, yes, absolutely, the last rites of a Muslim are 100% given to a person even if they died by suicide, right? And, and uh, what, but there, what happens is, and this is why we had all these kind of post-dimension measures of how should a community members deal. The articles, if you look at our articles on the do's and don'ts of suicide response, you'll see like, what should I say? What should I not say? How do I help? How do I, uh, you know, how do I talk to somebody who's a loss survivor like yourself, the person who has had a, lo- a family member, a loved one die by suicide? How, what do I even say to them? So we wrote guides. All of this is available on our website at the link I just put in the, the chat box. Um, to be able to help educate our community because there's a lot of misconceptions and a lot of strange ideas. We hear about people, you know, even, um, subhanAllah, this is very upsetting when I heard this actually more than once now, that a family family would take their, imagine they're intensely grieving because of the loss of their family member and it's done in this way and it's very jarring and difficult. And then on top of it all, they're going to try to bury them in the Muslim cemetery and the Muslim cemetery says, no, we won't take them. Yeah, and he, all kinds of strange ideas and confusion. So we really needed to set it straight. We have a paper coming out. It's a very large paper on the ethics, the Islamic ethics of suicide to answer exactly these very questions. And here we brought together our scientific team along with our religious leaders to really give clarity to exactly these kind of questions. So I hope, inshallah, these are resources you can all benefit from in the future. But I hope it also speaks to the importance of why these trainings are so key, uh, inshallah. Thank you for your response. There's one more question that I see. Um, I'm from France and it is difficult being a hijabi and a Muslim here. What advice would you give us? Should I expatriate to another country who accept hijab or do I have to fight for my rights even though it would be hard? This is a lady from France. I will make it easy for you, mashallah. Honestly, the Islamophobia levels of France and in other countries have yani, topped what they are in America. I mean, we deal with things here, but there are so much more in so many other countries. I cannot answer your specific question, sister, because this is something that's you know personal to you and you will need to make your own istikhara for, uh, your you know guidance prayers for, and to really make the best decisions for yourself and your family and your safety. Um, but I do pray for you, inshallah, that ease comes your way and that you're able to kind of practice your Islam fully and with pride and with uh, full ability. Um, and hopefully maybe even kind of enter into a field or have the kind of support similar to Mashallah, this group here at CARE, who are every day fighting for, you know, the rights and uh, ability to identify clearly and visibly as Muslims uh, here in the U.S. I hope something similar is already in place in France or really comes to comes to pass soon, inshallah. May Allah help you and guide you, inshallah. I mean. Um. Dr. Rangan, there is a question in here about those who live outside or reside outside of the United States and are foreigners. Is there any training available online or anything that they can get oh, yes. Is online? Yes. Yeah, so thank you for asking that question. In fact, I completely forgot to mention this, that one of our goals for 2022 Two, inshallah, is um, to convert our trainings into online trainings as well, to give you that option for online trainings. Um, it's not quite ready yet. Right now we're having these in-person live trainings, um, but hopefully very soon our modules on are completed and uh, done uh, to kind of make them available as an online training. And as soon as that's ready, please do follow us, inshallah, and you know make sure you're on our newsletters from Maristan, because as soon as they're ready, we will announce there, and that way it'll open up to um, um, folks who are international and even just folks even nationally who would like to take part, but maybe it's too far away to, to go to their particular location. Thank you, Dr. Avad. I see one more question. If somebody is prescribed for PTSD and is scared of taking medication for the fear of getting addicted to drugs, can you please describe how you can help in this situation? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. Um, PTSD is translated as post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, in short, we might call this trauma. And the uh, person who has PTSD has often been through a traumatic event, usually actually more than once, uh, often. And um, sometimes it's personal or sometimes it's environmental, like the country and place where a person is, and there's maybe some sort of trauma or upheaval. 
uh, or just even a personal thing like a car accident or a mugging or a rape or something to that effect, and it'll protect us all. And um, the gold standard treatment for something like PTSD is two part. It is medication, but it's also therapy. And some people will do therapy alone, depending on their level of trauma, which by the way, we say we kind of have a way to test it. This is why I ask and really recommend people get their psychiatric evaluation, because you will be able to tell after you do your evaluation, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe. And depending on the level of trauma, either you will be told you'll need both things, medication and therapy, or it may be to a level where therapy alone is sufficient. Whether or not you take the medication, depending on the, what, like you said, your own fears, subhanAllah, or whether it's because of the, um, uh, maybe you have a mild condition, doesn't warrant medication, uh, therapy is going to be so, so key. And the type of therapy we do is a very specific kind. It is a form of exposure therapy, which is a gradual, very careful, but slowly careful, but slowly kind of uh, gentle kind of exposure until the very things that a person has been traumatized by, they kind of master and are able to eventually overcome. By the way, I have to just kind of put in a historical little caveat here and say, uh, you know, in Belchi's writing that I talked about, the ninth century scholar, he talked about, can you believe it? He talked about exposure therapy. And when those historians of medicine read this, <laughs> read my work, they actually wrote back and were amazed. They were kind of blown away that he actually had written on not just the concept of therapy, but actually exposure therapy in specific. So panel, this is how amazing our scholars were. Allahu Akbar. Anyway, speaking of him and speaking to your question here, he mentions three, imagine this is ninth century and he's writing about three part for any men mental health condition, three parts of the treatment. He talks about medications and believe it or not, they had medications then. They were kind of compounded herbal concoctants and so on, so on, but medications. He talks about therapy, as I just mentioned. And thirdly, he talks about the spiritual treatments, reminding yourself that Allah's in control, reminding yourself and doing more prayer and more dhikr and more dua. So, so imagine this is his uh, <laughs> three-part technique, which absolutely applies even till today. To your other question about getting addicted, this is a very common question people have about medications. And um, sometimes they also ask about side effects. And the reality is you kind of have to we, you won't know if you have a side effect to something until you actually try. I think even some people have side effects to simple things like Tylenol that you take for a headache, right? But I understand that there's always this fear that some medications could be addictive. Well, these medications that you use for something like PTSD are not addictive in and of themselves. What people worry about is what happens if I have to stay on this for life? But only a trained professional can really tell you that because it might be something where you take a course of treatment for a period of time and you do really good work in your therapy, and we call it work because it actually takes work to do therapy, and you do that, and then alhamdulillah, you're able to lean off and get off that medication completely, and now you have techniques and tools in your toolbox to be able to help you through whenever you're triggered again by the trauma. And it may not be something you have to take for life. So, but again, you won't know until you actually get that evaluation and you put some trust in your care provider, your professional, who can help you through this. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you shifa um, and, and really do seek out the treatments because they are there to help you, inshallah. Thank you, Dr. Abad. That was a very valuable response. Thank you. So I, we have somebody else called Nabila who has a query for you. Um, I think she wants to get in touch with you. So I'll read her question. Um, I applied to be in the Muslim social worker in 2018, but the grant would not allow my LPC to be transferred from PA to California. I wanted to work there and enroll to earn my PhD. So I'm still on my quest in Philadelphia at Drexel. Wish I could have worked with you. May I contact you as a mentor? in my degree program, Nabila? Yes, <laughs> I know. Mashallah. Mashallah. The one place that I do mentor folks is within my lab, the Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab. There's, of course, very strict criteria of who is able to be part of that lab. So a person can always send a, um, you know, something like a, a CV and a, a letter, um, interest letter to see. And uh, if there makes sense and if their space and their person has some research background, um, you know, they, they might be able to be a mentor there. However, in the meantime, <laughs> mashallah, I encourage um, Sister Nabita to keep on trying, mashallah, because I hope that it means that you're able to, um, it sounds like you started already and you're trying to transfer. So I hope the transfer goes through for you, inshallah ta'ala. 
So we just had one more question. Um, how can I help somebody diagnosed with schizophrenia? Mm, yes, mashallah. Today we did not cover um, kind of distinctions of different kinds of mental health illnesses. I kind of refer to things like depression or obsessive compulsive disorder and so on. Um, schizophrenia, as many know here, is a condition that we consider on the more serious of the mental health the mental health um, spectrum. And um, it's it definitely will require a person to seek out professional mental health care. It really is important uh, because it is more serious in nature. And and the kind of disruption to a person's life could be much more, um, in, you know, invasive than perhaps something, uh, you know, uh, more mild, if you will. And so how does a person help? The first thing to know, when people don't like when I say this, but it's very important, is that you can't help someone who doesn't want to be helped. It's often very hard to say this, especially to a family member who wants their loved ones to get care. But if they are not a child and they're an adult, and they refuse that kind of care, it is really hard to see your family member going through a difficulty and you know that there could be help, but they're refusing. And so one thing I would encourage you to do is inspire them. Maybe if they were to listen to talks like this or understand more about our history or you know more about the heritage, you never know what could click for a person and kind of inspire them um, to get that care. But you keep on trying and you inspire them to get care. But remember, you can't ever force someone to get that care because they have to kind of want it for themselves. If the question was different and it relates to schizophrenia treatments in and of themselves, because of the more serious nature of the condition, it often does require medications. And uh, I, I'm not, not the person's doctor, so I can't say your particular loved one needs medication. I'm saying in general, this condition requires typically requires medications, um, and it does require the you know consistent observation of a mental health provider. So I hope you do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the resource was maristan.org backslash resources if you're looking for Muslim mental health providers, um, and generally anybody in your locale who is trained and competent, inshallah, can also be a good start to help you, inshallah. I see some requests um, uh, for the, the links to various things. So I'm going to go ahead and write them here in the chat so people know because they're asking about things like where are the trainings and where are the links, inshallah. You're very popular. Everybody <laughs> 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 wants to be in touch with you. We have somebody else who is also requesting um, to be in touch with you. Her name is um, Bushra Alharak. She's a former registered nurse from Morocco. So she sent her... Um, email and her address. So you can <laughs> take a look at it. I recommend, I recommend that folks um, who are interested to getting in touch with, with, with uh, inshallah, um, look at the, uh, the uh, follow. I think I put all the handles, which I'm happy to share again, kind of follow the, the various handles. Those are probably the best ways to get in touch with us, inshallah. Wonderful. I think maybe we can have Jacob do the give the closing remarks. I think Jacob is here. Uh, Jacob, we cannot hear you currently, sir. Now? Yes. Um, start video. As Executive Director of Care Philadelphia, I would like to extend our deepest appreciation to Dr. Awad for taking time out from her incredibly busy schedule to spend this evening with all of us. She reminds us that the mental and physical well-being of each individual soul was at the core of Islamic medicine, especially during the great age of Muslim civilization taking place around the Mediterranean basin and later the Middle East and later in Mughal Empire and then Ottoman Sultanate. Medical knowledge flourished in the lives of such geniuses as Ibn Sina, Ibn Rushd, and Ibn Maimun. At a time when the American public officials of, at the highest level openly questioned scientific data 
and belittle the findings of the scientific community on both the COVID pandemic and the climate crisis. Listening to her brilliant defense of therapeutic intervention and her courageous dedication to an open discussion of mental health and suicide in the Muslim community was akin for me to listening to the great Muslim physicians throughout the history of the Ummah. So thank you, Dr. Wad, not only for speaking for to us tonight, but for all you do for the Muslim community and the general public. So shukran jazilan. It was an honor and a pleasure to spend this evening with CARE, um, uh, mashallah, CARE Philadelphia, CARE Pittsburgh. I see all of you are here, mashallah, together. And I very much um, appreciate giving this space and really this very important conversation on mental health in our Muslim communities. Not every organization is ready to take on this conversation. And I really appreciate you taking on this conversation. May Allah accept from all of us our good deeds and work. Thank you so much.